such a beautiful way to start a rainy day. Thank you to the bells. Thank you to everybody who's come out today. Good morning and welcome to Broughton Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, an open and affirming church. No matter where you are or where, who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. And again, thanks for swimming out with this wonderful weather today. There are announcements in your bulletin, but there aren't too many of them, so I'll run down. Uh, today, after worship, is the third meeting in our visioning and developing workshop. Uh, we will have a lunch of grinders, chips, and soft drinks, and there's a lot of desserts there. Also, a reminder that next week is 5 to 5 Sunday, 5 Sundays in, in April, and consider adding an extra $5 to your donation. Women's Fellowship Yard Sale is coming up uh, on May 20th, and they will accept donations. May 16th through the 19th. I have a pile to bring in, so that's it. Put my house. We are also continuing to help the Early Childhood Development Center. There's still a need for diapers, pull-on boots, art supplies, and playground equipment, and they are so very grateful. Um, I work at the public library, and I see Clarissa come in, and she's, she's really thanks from the bottom of her heart. Community Meals is still taking place on Saturdays from noon to 1. Volunteers, as well as monetary donations, are being sought to help run this program. Contact Janice Kimball if you're interested. And Monday morning prayer and Bible study will gather this Monday and continue your conversations on Lesson 9 and the Covenants at 11 o'clock in person on Zoom. And now I have an announcement for our lovely comic service. Good morning. This announcement is for all the ladies here in attendance in the church today, in the ones at home. Phyllis Meyer is having a afternoon tea party Wednesday, May 3rd, 2 p.m. in Dutton Hall. The charge is $10, and all proceeds will be going to the church general fund. Please look in your attic or in your closet and find your grandmother's, or your mother's, or even your favorite hat, and wear it to the cheek. If you have some white gloves, please put them on. It's going to be a fun afternoon with laughs, revisiting with old friends, and enjoying various teas and sweets. And so, I will see you on May 3rd. No, I'll see you before that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of us who work, I think we should designate a Sunday where both men and women can wear hats. We'll try to get something in the gargoyle for that. <laughs> Please join me in the call. Yes, I made that first question. That was a question. Sorry, yes. yes, please join us. We're going to have lots of food. So. I was involved with music. Right? Yes, and it does. Please come and eat. Yes, <laughs> we're going to have lots of food. Please join me in the call to worship. Today is a new day. Jesus is with us when we walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Proclaiming that the past is behind us and inviting us into the future, which is wide open. Come, let us celebrate the new life that Christ brings and rejoice. Christ is with us. Christ is with us indeed. Please join us in hymn number 323, 231. Sing of one who walks beside us.
to fall into your hands, to be shaped like clay, to be forced through the fire of suffering and conflict. Grant that we might rejoice in your work within and among us, and that we might find our home in the hollow of your hand, through Jesus our risen Christ, to whom we praise and honor and in glory forever.
And I invite you now to turn to your bulletins and join in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, through the precious Lamb who is our Christ, you have redeemed us beyond the perishable silver and gold we now present to you. We pay our vows of devotion, offering you these sacrifices of thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you. And Doris is going to come forward and offer you this day. Welcome to all of you who have come on this rather dull or dingy day. <laughs> I would like to remind you that it's too easy to walk past the beautiful things of the world, particularly on a dull and dingy day. And that we do that all the time in this church. Those who stand up here get to look at our wonderful church window in the back, but you don't. So please do me a favor and turn around and take a look at the window, and I mean that. Really take a look at it. There was a website that rated the windows of the stained glass of Connecticut, and that one ranked number one. Now, that is despite the fact that our Tiffany window is this window. This was made by a student of Tiffany. Now, when I was a child, I walked past that window, and nobody told me anything about it. And I thought the gentleman that's in the wonderful robe standing up a step was Jesus, since he clearly was in command of that situation. But it isn't so. It isn't Jesus. My idea of what Jesus was was completely unformed. However, our minister gave a speech of sermon on that window, and he told us it is about the parable of the talents. Now, did all of you know it was about the parable of the talents? I know some of you do. Now, how did he know? Well, he know because the inscription on the bottom says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, A.D. 1902. And being a well-educated minister, he knew that was from Matthew 25, verse 21, which is in the middle of the parable of the town. So, of course, he knew. And so I learned that the gentleman standing there in those beautiful robes is the master from the parable of the talents who is not Jesus. <laughs> so this is a good thing to know. And even the parable of the talents itself has two versions. One is in Luke, one in Matthew. And it is kind of controversial in its own way because the master in that story has gone off to a foreign country. And I'll write this story in modern terms. He has three stewards to take care of stuff while he's gone. And he gives one $125,000, he gives one $75,000, and he gives one $25,000. And he goes off and he does his business in the book business, what he's doing is getting crowned king, but that doesn't happen in Matthew. And he comes back and he gathers his three stewards together, and he asks what they did with the money. And the first one said, well, you gave me $125,000, and here's $250,000. And he said to the second one, the second one says, I gave you $75,000, here's $150,000. And he said to the third one, where, where, where is it? And he says, well, I know that you're a hard man, and that you, you know, take what you don't sow, and you reap what you don't throw straw over. So I hid the money under the bed, and here it is. <laughs> and, the, and the master says, I'm a hard man, am I? I'll judge you by your own works. Well, 
If I'm such a hard man, why didn't you put the money in the money market and at least make me basic interest? <laughs> and he said, of course, you're fired into the outer of the darkness. <laughs> now, that's an interesting story because, and I just sort of understood it, although I got mixed up with the part where it's about talents, that talents is, what a talent is, is 75 pounds of silver. It's a substantial investment then, it's a substantial investment now. It's about the amount of money I told you. And as a child, what it meant when I walked out of church after listening to that sermon, I felt that I did not measure up. God gave it, it, you know, because God was okay with however much you got. He was just as happy with the guy that doubled the five-talent investment as he was with the one who doubled the two-talent investment. They both had good things entrusted to them in the future. But, so I kind of focused on, maybe I can't be the five-talent guy, maybe I can be the two-talent guy. But I don't want to be the one-talent guy. But every week I go out and look at it, and I did I do enough? Well, I don't know. And, and people misinterpret this story any number of ways. But you knew this was going to be a stewardship pitch eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so we are all stewards, and we have all been giving something. And the reward is about the same. But I think double is a little high. <laughs> But five on five next week would be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and just in case you think I was misinterpreting the uh, venture capitalist version of the parable of the talents, <laughs> please be aware that last fall, Trinity Church on the corner of Wall Street and Broadway put up a new stained glass window to the, parable, to the parable of the talents, particularly designed to be viewed from the outside, and the outside faces to Wall Street. <laughs> Door sounds good. <laughs> there are many interpretations of that parable, as you can imagine. Yes, and I am not going to go into it now, but thank you so much, and so please consider uh, the ways that you give your gifts to the world, to the church, the congregation, um, as we go forward, particularly in this time, day, and age. And, you know, the, those who are without anything at all, sometimes, are the ones who offer the most gifts, are they not? And so, may we consider the ways that we offer who we are um, as we go forward this day. Um, I wish that you could come in here right now. The handbell choir is rehearsing at 6.30 in the evening. And the sun is, I've got pictures on my camera from last Thursday. The sun coming through those glass. The, yeah. the, the, and the that's another thing I was going to mention. I didn't notice until a couple of years ago, the sky is a sunset sky. Yeah. And when you have the real sunset, behind the glass sunset, it's beyond belief. It is just stunning. It just sparkles. And so I've got pictures on my camera. It doesn't do it justice, but I will be glad to show you at some point. But thank you, Doris, for your gift this day. Um, let us now move into a time of sharing our joys and concerns. And on Friday, I quickly got a text from Lisa's story, and she had asked me if I would please lift up prayers for the family of the driver of that oil truck, whose truck turned over, for his soul and for all the emergency responders, and for the work that they are all doing, and to the heroes, please. Um, there are many that were living without water, it has been restored, but they, she gives thanks that um, there were some quick responders that helped remove people from the cars, and all the tragedies that, were, that, that unfolded. You know, it's, a, it's amazing, isn't it, how in the blink of an eye, the blink of an eye, lives change. And so we are those who are gathered here each week, being nourished by one another's presence, being nourished by the stories of scripture, 
and being invited into being present to each other and sharing our gifts of presence and love um, as we go forward, not knowing, but also knowing that we have much to learn from each other. And so we lift up prayers for this family and for our community, and Lisa was moved. She says, my, my faith in humanity is being restored as I watch all of this, this thing. And so for them, the oh Lord, we lift up our prayers, hear our prayers this day. We lift up prayers for those who are continuing to face into COVID um, illness, but also those who are facing long-term COVID complications. I was with my daughter yesterday, and she shared that one of her co-workers has been ill since September and is still facing that, and actually Yale is developing a center for long-term COVID cases. And so for all of those still struggling, O oh God of grace, hear our prayers. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen the news stories of those who are in Sudan and caught in the crossfires, and also those ongoing in Ukraine and struggling. And Lord, how we pray for your peace to move the hearts of people so that we can see peace prevail. O oh Lord of grace, hear our prayers. And also for those who are hungry and homeless, some who we can help and some who we can't even see. We pray for them as well. Hear our prayers. I know that Connie wanted to offer a prayer. I ask for prayers for Roz Romack. She is in the hospital right now. And um, she'll probably be coming home shortly. I ask, uh, she asked me to mention that she wishes no calls or no visitors at this time, but please, if you wish, send her a card at her address in our telephone directory. It will cheer her up. We we'll hope that she's doing better. So we lift the prayers for Roz, who is now at the hospital, and may God be with her in the midst of all that is there for the, the doctors and nurses to help her healing. For oh God of grace, hear our prayers. And Jack communicating with me early this morning, leave the church in Eastford, Connecticut. Um, sustained, it went through a fire. Burned to the ground. Burned to the ground. Oh. And the gathering at this time at school. And the gathering of school at this time. And so for the congregation in Eastford, Lord, hear our prayer that you will be with them and help them to find ways to continue to be a congregation and find renewed sense of purpose and mission and, and love. Your prayer. Yes. Are there others? Yes. Um, I'm, I want to give thanks in relation to Doris's uh, presentation about the window. It was because of Mary Healy and her talents that that window was restored so many years ago. And as we found out, it was in desperate need. So we thank her for that. Thank you. And Mary, your husband's first name. Joseph, we lift up prayers of thanksgiving for Mary and Joseph Healy, who helped to restore the window. Oh God, grace here, Yes, and came Prayers for those who react to surprises with violence. Mm -hmm. After all the shootings this past week that were responses to somebody knocking on the wrong door, pulling into the wrong driveway, going up to the wrong car, a basketball rolling into a driveway. I mean, all of the ones who have been shot need our prayers, but the ones who really need the healing prayers are those who react with violence to those types of things, rather than, oh, how can I help you? Oh, the house you're looking for is over there. All right, uh, Ingrid is lifting up prayers for those who react with violence instead of listening and offering to help those who come knocking at the door of a basketball rolled into a driveway. Lord, our nation is at a place where we are just too strained and too tense. Um, I would like to ask for the news channels to stop being a crime report and just reporting all the violence and move back into sharing some other stories. But for all of us, may we not be first reacting with fear, but rather to pause and listen and be those who let love lead us and not just that fear. I know that's a hard request. <laughs> but may we be those here who practice it with one another, oh God of grace, hear our prayers, and be with those who lost a loved one because of that 
I might have to scratch my whole sermon here today. <laughs> that was just absolutely beautiful. When we um, were practicing the I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light for handles, the suggestion was made that we sing this as well at that time. I, let's do this as a middle hymn. I love this piece. I've heard it and sung it for years through the Methodist churches um, hymnal. Um, I began singing it, believe it or not, when I was a student pastor in Niantic Community Church. Oh, wait, when was that? 1991, I think it was, that we began to sing it, and it was a Christmas hymn that we sang. And so I invite you to, you may not know the hymn, we actually sang this a year ago, believe it or not, um, during one of our services. And so if Sue would play through it one time, let us rise and join in singing this beautiful hymn.
vibrates and it just rises up <laughs> for you. And you're so touched. Thank you for your solo. This is amazing. So we're um, the Isaiah passage is part of my sermon, so we'll move right to the Luke. So this is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. The road to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. We would hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and they did not find his body there. And they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of an angel who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. They did not see him. When he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were, were our, not, our hearts burning within us? While he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being there with them? and having their eyes open. Well, many of you know that I love to go to the cook beach first thing in the morning, and I love to sit there by the water, even today, in the midst of all the rain and thunder and lightning, with my morning coffee, and watch the seagulls uh, flying through the air. And today, boy, they were battling that wind and wondering what to do. But I love to watch on some days as the water is reflecting, as the sun is reflecting on the water. It was a bit rough today, and yet it's fascinating to watch the seagulls who struggle against the strong winds, and all of a sudden they catch the wind just right and soar, right through the air. And they can be carried gracefully over the water and the sand, and then land exactly where they want to. And yesterday I noticed that the tide began to come in stronger. It had ebbed out, as it always does, and now the tide had turned. The waves were increasing, and I could see a little bit of the white caps as the size of the waves were increasing. It was absolutely beautiful to witness, and it is every morning. I could see yesterday that the music of the sea was changing. As I watched, I thought about how it is with each of our lives. And I considered this scripture passage from Luke about what was happening to these men as they were walking on the road to Emmaus and how they would be experiencing a turning of the tide in their own lives in a very big, significant way. They were in deep grief, having lost this beloved teacher in such a very cruel and un irrational way we don't know exactly what they were saying until all of a sudden this man came up to them. We read that though they didn't recognize Jesus at the time, 
He began to ask them what they were talking about, and they began to share about this amazing man and this teacher that was killed by the leaders of the region who chose to condemn him. And so he was crucified before the world. As the conversation unfolded, and then they went into supper, there came a moment when Jesus took the bread and broke it and blessed it and gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were open and they knew exactly who it was. Oh my goodness, wouldn't it be amazing to have such an experience like that in the breaking of the bread? And to experience the living Christ just like that, right here. In that moment, Jesus knew he had to bless them and not stay. He did not stay, but rather empowered them to go out into the world with this message of the resurrection and Easter joy. And so he disappeared. It was now in their hands to pass on into the world the message of love, but also forgiveness, most especially. For now they were living in the world daily in their communities and families, they, where many did not know what to do with this, this story of the risen Christ. And it was the message of forgiveness that Jesus offered from the cross, saying, Father, forgive them, the ones who put the nails in his hands and his feet. That led to the most amazing joy of Easter morning. There were people that they would meet along the way who would not be able to receive this news because it would not make any sense at all. I remember those days. Do you? Nah, that can't be possible. I remember. It was not until my 40s that I began to even hear the details of the story. Do you understand that? They were going to have to break through many people's mindsets and through the ways it had always been before. Come on, you can't be serious about this. What do you mean? I'm sure they heard that many times as they went out into the world to tell this story. Sadly, if you keep going through the scriptures, you find out that many were killed. Some were crucified, some were stoned. Even the man we know as St. Paul was doing those activities until he was blinded on the road to Damascus and had his encounter with the risen Christ, and became transformed to become the leading apostle. If you read the stories of the early Christians, they did not have easy lives. And even up to today, we know that there are those who have been prophets who were not well received, such as Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King Jr., Oscar Romero, Eddie Hewison, and Anne Frank. There's a man, though, that many of you know as St. Francis, who wrote a prayer that many of us have heard. And I have been pondering this prayer for a long time, ever since my daughter was born. I made a cross to each other. And that phrase, being instruments of God's peace, is what I decided to choose for my sermon title today, because I know that that is what we are being called to do every single day of our lives. Through our lives, we learn that as we are seeing in our own nation, as Ingrid was mentioning today, sometimes we have to encounter that which is not peace at first. In order to be moved within our souls and spirits to engage in helping to bring about the reconciliation and help to be the agents of peace in the world, the instruments to bring things back to balance. This morning, as we were uh, scheduled to play out on the walk as a child of the light. I just love that song. I can't stop singing it. But I wanted us to sing it as a, as a group. But I want you to hear the story that is also kind of behind my motivation to think more about being instruments of peace and the fact that we are children of the light. Because, again, I, some of you were here when I told the story about Otis Moss, and thank goodness that Janice gave me this book and I saw an interview with Otis Moss where he was talking about his daughter who, at 3 o'clock in the morning, was making, was doing something and making a noise and didn't know what it was, and he went into her bedroom, and there she was doing her dance recital, in the complete darkness and in her dance tutu or whatever it was, and having a wonderful time, and 
he was frightened at first, but he opened that door and saw her dancing. And though he went to tell her to be, go back to bed, he heard a message inside his heart and soul. And the message says, look at her. She's not afraid of the dark. You are. You are. Take your flashlight and see what happens when you shine your light in that dark room. What happens, folks, when you shine your light in the dark room? You can see, but what happens to the darkness? It disappears, doesn't it? All right, so we, who are we? If we're children of the light, what are we doing? We're taking our candles into that darkness. That darkness of fear, and it scatters and dissolves. So we are the children of the light. And he was going to take his light out into the world, because I don't know if you know what's going on in Chicago, with the United Church of Christ churches, also in Hartford, Connecticut, but they're receiving bomb threats at the black churches. And so they have to find their light and not let anybody distinguish it. So they went forward. And so we are those who are also hearing the same message. And in that Isaiah passage, think about how it was written, what, 3,000 years ago? The prophet Isaiah knew he had to speak these words that he was hearing to help people understand how to create their communities. Thus says the Lord, who he who created you, O Jacob and O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, like the waters we went through today, okay? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, and because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I will, let you, I will lead you forward. Fear not, for I am with you. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And then in Isaiah 45 we hear, I will go before you and open the doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches, and stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord. And so it continues in there. And so as we go forward, I was thinking about where do I close my sermon, and I was thinking about um, the passages. How do we go forward as people of faith who received all these messages, who are, you know, if we are to be instruments of God's peace? One of the most important questions we have to ask first is, whom are we serving? Whom are we serving? Joshua 24 is a question that was that question was asked as we were doing Bible study, where Joshua is now in front of a lot of different people who have many different gods and they're coming in with many different traditions. And he goes, You've got to think about what, who are you serving, folks? As for me and my household, we serve Yahweh. Many of them didn't know what that meant, who Yahweh was, and so he was trying to help them with that. But I wish that he had had the passage from Micah 6. 6 through 8, which he would clearly have shown them. But that came at a later time. Many of you know those words, which is, what does the Lord require of you? It's not the sacrifice of oil or animals, and certainly not your children, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly. How do we get there? It only comes from bumping into each other that we get there as we encounter one another and have to learn the walk of forgiveness. I don't know if you've ever paid really close attention to the words that I share every time I serve communion, but there's a phrase that I add intentionally because I learned it a long time ago. When I serve the cup, I say, remember, Jesus says, remember me every time you receive the cup of salvation. And I add this phrase because I was taught this. Walk into the new life that Christ brings because of the forgiveness of sins. The past 
is gone. Today is a brand new day. Let us give thanks as we share the cup. And so today we are entering into a new day after Easter with that good news story. And as Charity said, we're walking toward Pentecost. Yeah, that was a good sermon last week. Each new day we get to practice this new life. And so as I was considering again how to close this time together, how do we do that? I know that many of you dearly loved Amanda I, I will say I love, who came here and preached to you many times. And his name was Sadat Balgobin. And I've heard many of you talk about how you wished that he had come and preached to you. Well, on Monday night, I shared this with the council, and I'm going to share it with you too. So if you take one, pass it on. I don't know if you know those, but... Uh, those who, yeah, Bonnie and Sue, would you come up and pass these out? You don't have anything better to do on a rainy day, do you? <laughs> uh, that, oh, yeah. I was with a group with Sadat for 14 years of pastors and um, spiritual directors, and we met at his house almost every single month for 14 years. And one of the times that we were meeting, he read this to us, and we all asked for a copy of it. But as uh, pastors and spiritual directors, we gathered because we really needed to talk some things through about what was going on in our congregations and how to be present to, to people and to, to gain some clarity. And Saddam was really good with me. <laughs> he looked me straight in the eye and go, Lee, don't go for the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Just remember what is here and what is the next right step that you can do. But most especially, I don't know, do you need more out there? No. But most especially, one of the things that Sadat did was he tried to remind us we're only human. We're not here to be perfect. Nobody is. The greatest gift that we can offer one another is being human and learning the way of forgiveness. And so if everybody has a copy of this, I'm going to read it to you. Do you have it? Oh, here. I've got a picture. Oh, here, I have it. Okay, but th this is probably one of the best things that I have ever read, and I offer it no matter where I go. Dear human, you've got it all wrong. You didn't come here to master unconditional love. This is where you came from and where you will return. You came here to learn personal love, universal love, messy love, sweaty love, crazy love, broken love, whole love. Infused with divinity, lived through the grace of stumbling. Demonstrated through the beauty of messing up, often. Right? You didn't come here to be perfect, you already are. You came here to be gorgeously human, flawed and fabulous, and rising again into remembering. But unconditional love stopped telling that story. Love and truth does not need any adjectives. It doesn't need, require modifiers or the condition of perfection. It only asks you to show up and do your best. That you stay present and feel fully, that you shine and fly and laugh and cry and hurt and heal and fall and get back up and play and work and live and die as you. It's enough. It's plenty. Amen. And so as we go forward, there were there were a lot of moments when everybody tried to make me to be somebody that I could not be. Be like Joel Austin. I can't. And I won't. Be like this and be like that. I can't and I won't. And so as we are children of the light, we are here to lift up our candles. We are here as a, a community of faith. And I'm going to say this out loud. 
to not pretend to be something that we are not, and don't ask me to be something I can't be, but rather to be a person of love that has learned through the ways of forgiveness how to be a human being and to share the love. And so as we go forward, we're going to be the bearers of the light in this very dark world right now that is very broken and trying to find those who will be present to them and share the light and the love. And it's not easy, but it's so priceless when it occurs. That's what Lisa's story saw yesterday, or on Friday, and she was most great, grateful. And so as we move into a time of understanding how to be the church in these times, the question is, how do we be the instruments of God's peace? All we can do is try and be with one another and see what comes. And so believe it or not, I chose this closing hymn, what, a month ago? I don't know when it was, but it's, it's one that you have sung many times, I'm sure. But see what happens as you sing it today. And we offer our response to God's call on April 23rd, 2023. Amen. And I don't even know what number it is. 452. Thank you. Good job.
February of 1985 as I watched the movie Sophie's Choice. My heart was shattered as I knew what happened during the Holocaust, and I said, here I am, Lord. Here I am. We are walking through difficult times, but I know who's walking with me, and I give thanks. And so may we hear these words of the benediction. Fellow walkers along the way, as we continue our journeys, be aware of the risen Christ and the ones who were once strangers. While you walk, while you eat, while you live, and while you breathe, to testify to the living Christ among us all, go in that love and peace to serve our God. Amen.